last talk in the session, we're happy to have Anna Barnaka from Harvard to talk, talk to us about resolving high the high energy universe using strong gravitational lensing. I would like to thank the organizers for organizing such a wonderful conference and thank you for inviting me so I can tell you how we can turn galaxy into high resolution telescope and get one million arc second resolution at gamma rays. So let's begin. Extragalactic jets are the largest particle accelerators in the universe. They transport energy from regions very close to supermassive black hole up to hundreds of kiloparsecs into intergalactic space. They are also known to produce a huge outburst of emission. And we believe that this huge variable emission is produced somewhere very close to supermassive black hole. But this image shows M87 jet picture with Chandra. In 2004, Chandra detected huge outbursts from M87. And thanks to improvangular resolution of Chandra instrument, we have learned that this huge X-ray outburst was not originating from the region close to the massive black hole that we call, call core, but was originating from the HST1 knot that is one of the knots along the jet. The projected distance between the core and HST1 is about 60 parsecs. And at the same time, when we detected the maximum of X-ray emission, we also detected TV flare with Cherenkov telescopes. But there is ambiguity from where, uh, from where this, X, this TV flare originates, because gamma ray telescopes don't have angular resolution to resolve the emission. Gamma ray telescopes have at best angular resolution of 0.1 degree, which means that we would have to improve angular resolution of gamma ray telescope by a factor of 1,000 to only resolve emission of M87 that is one of the nearest uh, extragalactic jets. The future instruments will provide improvement by a factor of two. Example of M87 makes us further wonder how frequently emission is not originating from the regions close to supermassive black hole, but is produced somewhere along the jet. Or what is the origin of gamma ray flares? We could resolve M87 with Chandra instrument because M87 is a nearby source. But we cannot resolve emission from more distant sources or at higher energies. Or can we? What if uh, M87 were gravitationally lensed? In such configuration, the emission of distant uh, source, we would have a galaxy between us and the distant source, and this massive galaxy would curve the spacetime. Curve spacetime tells the light how to move. In such configuration, we will have multiple paths of the mirage images, and those paths would have a different distance. And because we have a different distance, we would have a, a time delay between emission originating from mirage images. And those time delays will depend on the position of the source in relation to the center of the lens. So if we can measure those time delays, we can find out from where the emission is coming from. Now, imagine that M87 would be at the redshift equals one, and between us, M87, there would be a, a galaxy. M87 has emission from somewhere close to a supermassive black hole that we call core, and also we have this HST1 knot. And those two emitting regions would be, separate, would be at different distance from the center of the lens, which means that we would expect different time delays depending where the emission would be produced. And in this configuration, we would expect the difference in the time delays depending where the emission was produced, and this difference would be around two days. We can measure time delays with much greater accuracy. And we have also gravitationally lensed blazers that we can use to find those time delays and uh, discriminate from where the emission is coming from. The first source is PICA S 1830. It's a gravitationally lens blazer, which is a very bright gamma ray emitter and also very bright radio source. So this image shows the radio map where you can see that those two red uh, parts are mirage images of the radio core. And also we can see the ring-like structure which is made of extended emission of the jet. The radio observations give us the time delay for the emission originating from the radio core. And we know that from the radio core, we expect time delay of about 26 plus minus five days. And 
and Fermi, Fermi satellite provides us excellent temporal resolution. Since 2008, Fermi is observing the entire sky, giving us excellent light curve. And for PKS 1830, we observed four series of flares, and we measured the time delay during each flare. And for the flare number one, we find that the time delay was about 23 days. For flare number two, the time delay is about 20 days. And then we had two series of flares for which the time delay must be greater than 50 days. Now, radio observations give us the model of the lens, so we can calculate what is the expected time delay in, for every position in the lens plane. And from the radio observations, we know also we can reconstruct the position of the radio core. So the radio core is on this time delay map is located here. And then we can combine, we can compare the time delays that we have for flare number two and flare number two, for flare number one and flare number two, and we find that those two flares are consistent with the origination from the radio core within 100 parsecs. Then from the radio emission, we know also what's the projection of the jet in this time delay map. So we know where the jet is located, and we know also the prediction of the time delay along the jet. And we find that those Flare number three and flare number four had a time delay greater than 50 days, which tells us that those two flares flare were produced somewhere at least 1.5 kiloparsecs from the radio core. We've been able to resolve gamma ray emission of PKS 1830 with angular resolution down to about 100 parsecs. 100 parsecs for the source correspond to about 0.02 arc seconds, which, which is uh, similar to the angular resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. But I promise you one milli arc second resolution, so let's look at another, another object. So B20218 is another gravitationally lensed blazer that is very bright gamma ray emitter and also very bright radio emitter. So this time you can see the radio map and two mirage images of this radio source, of the radio core, and also you can see Einstein ring, which is made of extended emission of the jet. So because we see this, uh, this Einstein ring, it tells us that the jet has to uh, be projected toward the center of the lens. And we can use radio observations, especially the VLBI observations, to reconstruct the model of the lens. And we are able to do it with the resolution of one milli arc second. So we can, because this source is very, uh, very simple, the lens is very simple, we are able to get the resolution of this lens down to one milli arc second. And also, the radio observations give us the time delay. And the time delay for the emission originating from this radio core is about 10.5, 10.5 plus 0.5 days. And again, Fermi provides us excellent light curve. So this is Fermi light curve for one of the brightest uh, flare of the source. This flare, flare lasted for about 200 days. And because we have such a uniform sampling from Fermi satellite, we have been able to measure gravitationally induced time delay at gamma rays of about 11.4 days with a accuracy of three hours. So if you compare the time delay at radio that was 10.5 days and the time delay at gamma rays of 11.4 days, it tells us that those time delays are not the same. But at radio, we don't have a good temporal resolution, so our measurement of the time delay is about 0.5 days, which precludes conclusion whether this gamma ray flare originated from the radio core. So at radio, we don't have a good temporal resolution but we have an excellent angular resolution. At gamma rays, we don't have angular resolution, but we have an excellent temporal resolution. So if we want to get a one milli arc second resolution, we have to use different approach. So this is what we are going to do. Traditionally, people have been using well-measured uh, well time delays and position of well-resolved uh, position of the radio core and the model of the lens to get the Hubble constant. Today, we know more or less, what the Hubble constant is. So we can invert the problem and we can use cosmological parameters in combination with the well-measured time delay at gamma rays, position of the radio core, well-resolved, 
with, uh, with VLBI and model of the lens to find out whether the emission, the radio and gamma ray emission, is originating from the same place. So this is how it works. So when we combine model of the lens and the position of the radio core, we can measure, we can check what the Hubble constant is. So if we, if we combine radio positions and the model of the lens, we find the Hubble constant is 67.3 days, which is consistent with, the, with, with Hubble. But then if we use position of the radio core and time delay at gamma rays, so if the time delay, if the gamma ray emission originates from the same place as the radio core, we should get Hubble constant of about 67.3. But if the time delay, if the gamma ray flare originated from different place, we will get the wrong Hubble constant and the offset between the true value of Hubble constant and the one we get will tell us how far away this gamma ray flare was produced from the radio core. So when we add gamma ray flare, gamma ray time delay, we get Hubble constant of about 63 days, 63. So we, st we still are not sure whether Hubble constant is 67 or 72, but we know that it's not 63. So this tells us that there is an offset between gamma ray flare, the origin of the gamma ray flare, and the radio core. And the lens model allows us to calculate that this offset between the radio core, that the projected distance between the radio core and the gamma ray flare is about 50 parsecs, plus minus eight parsecs. So here we get the resolution, the three hour resolution accuracy corresponds into the, in the lens plane to one milli arc second resolution. But that's at the end of the story because here is the position of the core. From the radio observations, we know that the jet is projected in this direction, which tells us that the supermassive black hole must be somewhere here. So as a conclusion, we learn that the radio core is not located close to the supermassive black hole. It tells us that the supermassive black hole must be located at least 50 parsec, parsecs from the radio core. This is a huge distance, and this is projected distance. So we, we can get one milli second resolution, and we learn that this radio core is, that we have an offset between the radio core and the supermassive black hole. So how we could miss that kind of uh, huge offset between the radio emission and supermassive black hole? We can do it pretty easily because only radio telescopes give us angular resolution to resolve those kind of scales. This offset corresponds to about six milli arc seconds. So optical telescopes don't have enough resolution to be able to resolve those scales. So how we can find out with different objects, with different sources, whether we have this kind of offset, how, how often the radio core is far away from the supermassive black hole. We can use gravitational lensing and uh, lenses that have elliptical mass distribution. Because when we have an elliptical lens, those, those lenses will produce caustics. Those caustics are, have a shape of a diamond. And when the source is inside this caustic, then we have four mirage images. And those positions of those four mirage images will change uh, relative to each other when the source is changing its posi position. So here you can see the simulation. We will put few sources close to the caustic and we will see how the position of the mirage images will change. So when we are outside the caustic, then we observe two mirage images. But when the source is inside the caustic, we see four mirage images. There is one more and there are three others. And here we change the position of the source only by one milli arc second. And you can see, you, we cannot see those changes in the source position, but we see those changes in the position of the mirage images. So here is the idea. If the optical and radio emission for lens blazers that are in this close to the caustic, if those mirage images will have exactly the same positions in, at optical and radio, it means that there is no offset between optical and radio emission. But if we compare the radio well-resolved radio mirage images with optical images, and they have a different configuration, they have a different positions, it will tell us about the offset, and we can use the lensing to find out, to measure exactly what the offset is. 
And you may wonder how often we will find, have those quasars, those bright quasars with radio emission close to the caustic that are able to produce this, such kind of effect. So here is the list of, so this is a survey of 20 flat spectrum radio quasars. And when you are in the caustic configuration, we have four mirage images, and caustic is the place where mirage images are formed, they are created. So two mirage images ver will be very close to each other. So when we look on the survey of 20 gravitationally length flat spectrum radio quasars, large number of them are in the caustic configuration. Actually, eight out of 20 of the sources are in this caustic configuration. And what is even more exciting is that in the near future, large survey like SKA, like Euclid, LS LSST will provide detection of uh, hundreds of thousands gravitationally lensed quasars that will allow us to look inside inner parts of, of a galaxies. So to summarize, using cosmic lenses, we've been able to get one milli arc second resolution at gamma rays. And we have learned that these gamma flare flares are not always from the radio core. And we have also learned that the radio core is not always close to this massive black hole. The caustic configuration and the lensing allow us to give gives us large magnific flux magnification so we can look into very distant objects and also give us the offset amplification so we can look for offsets between optical and uh, radio emission. This method will give us an insight into the inner regions of the galaxies. And currently we have a dozen of sources, but in the near future, in, within a few years, we will have a hundred of thousands gravitationally lensed quasars that will allow us to use lensing to learn about the physics of quasars. Thank you. Great talk. Do we have any questions? See anything back there? Oh, over there. Somewhere. Yes. Uh, I have a very naive question. Um, so it seems that what we've learned from these observations is in more detail where the TV versus the radio emissions come from. Uh, can you comment on what that teaches us about the dynamics of these uh, large black holes? Does it, does it tell us anything about um, the accretion disk or any, any, any of those kinds of things? So first of all, we have to question our understanding what the radio core is. Because we always assume that this is a mission like within one parsec from the, from the supermassive black hole. So it tells us that it's not the part, it's not the base of the jet. So most probably what it tells us in this case is that uh, it's a recollimation shock, like in M87. So if you go back to M87, we, because it's a nearby source and the um, angle of the jet is, is uh, pretty large, it's about 20 degrees. In case of blazers, the angle is like three degrees. And what we see uh, with, uh, with blazers is always uh, emission enhanced from, uh, from relativistic effects. So probably what we see in the case of blazers, what we interpret as a radio core is just a recollimation shock, which is kind of interesting because um, uh, it, we, have, we would have to assume different physics because we see uh, we often see gamma rays, gamma ray flares, which are correlated with the radio core, and sometimes we see that we don't have gamma ray flares. And we can explain gamma ray flares close to the black hole, but we cannot explain them far away. So this will force our further, uh, we have to understand how particles can be accelerated so far away from a supermassive black hole. So that's one point that we can, we can learn. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, far in the corner, yes. Um, in the case of, <coughs> sorry, in the case of PKS 1830, you derive the uh, distance between the uh, gamma ray source and the, I presume, the center of the galaxy of 1.5 kiloparsec, right? But that was projected, which means that the real displacement is, is like 10 kiloparsecs. Yes, even more. Even more. So how would you combine this with the conventional models of AGNs? So this is exactly what we just discussed, that we don't have a good model to explain how you can uh, accelerate particles in such a short uh, period of time at such a large distances. So this is a very interesting question. But you are now discussing like 100 parsecs, as I understood, but not like 10 kiloparsecs. 
yes, so far beyond any reclamation shock or anything else. So basically, we, we don't have a good model for that. And uh, we didn't expect to see gamma flares produced so far away, so we don't have good models for now. Because shocks cannot explain that. So it raises interesting question about particle acceleration mechanism. Are there any other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again. And uh, real quick before everybody.